because it's a hot flaming pile of garbage. <laughs> Everyone here is young and attractive. Oh my God. What does that mean? Hi guys, it's Suri. So welcome back to my channel. a video I had not expected and not planned on doing at all. It comes as a surprise to me as it does to you. But unfortunately, I ended up reading a book this weekend that uh, I needed to do a video about. And the only reason I continued reading after page 150 or so is because I wanted to do this video. So I hope you appreciate the trouble and honestly suffering I went through <laughs> in order to bring you guys this video because I just felt the need to talk about this. Here we are, let's talk about the glorious trash fire that is The Beautiful by Renée Adier. This was my first book by Renée Adier. I know she's written a bunch of other things but I never was really interested in any of her books. The reason I wanted to pick this one up specifically is because it hearkened to me of the glorious final return of vampires to YA and uh, I honestly couldn't wait. This was one of my favorite genres growing up and uh, oh my god reading it again now like coming back to it fresh take fresh like 20 19 take on it. Mm, I love it. I was here for it okay and fairly quickly I realized this wasn't gonna be it. This book follows a young woman called Celine. She's from France and uh, something mysterious, terrible has happened in her past which has led her to have to flee France and go take a ship to New Orleans where she's supposed to join a convent and eventually like find a proper husband and stuff like that basically. Oh, I forgot to mention this book is set in the 1870s. However, in New Orleans, Celeste gets drawn into the Court of Lions which I'm not actually sure exactly what they are. It's like this association of paranormal, supernatural people and uh, a murder occurs. One of the other girls at the convent dies and they're trying to solve the murder. Honestly, there isn't all that much plot here. It's really very bare bones, like the barest semblance of a story. <laughs> and it, none of it is particularly interesting, so forgive me if I didn't pay super close attention throughout reading this. Because mm, uh, I was like literally just skimming the second half of this because they were so boring. <laughs> but I digress, we'll get to the plot later. Let's first talk about the writing. I think that's typically what we all notice first about a book, and in this case, I wasn't really sure what to make of it. There were a few instances right at the beginning that had me kind of raised my eyebrows but then also other times I actually kind of enjoyed it so at first I wasn't really sure what direction or like what camp I was going to fall into if I was going to like it or hate it but very quickly I grew to absolutely loathe this writing for the plain and simple reason that it a lot of the times does not make any sense. I appreciate an author that knows how to write very flowery like I appreciate that in certain books like with lots of similes and metaphors that really tries to kind of draw you into the story and make you feel like you're experiencing it for yourself. I typically quite appreciate this, but in this book there were so many instances of certain lines that I just, they just didn't make sense. Like they sounded nice at a cursory glance, but once you started thinking about them, even just a little bit, they turned out to not have any meaning behind them. And I just want to give you a few examples so you kind of know what I'm talking about. The first time I actively noticed this is very early in the book on page 24. She sat up straighter, comma, her petite features gathering. And I thought about this and I was like, what does it mean to have features gathering? Honestly, the first thing that jumped into my mind was like her facial, like her mouth, her nose, her eyes just sort of arranging themselves in her in the middle of her face, like gathering in the middle, right? Like that makes no sense. And neither does the sentence. Another gem is a frown touched Bastion's lips. And I was thinking, how does a frown touch your lips? Your frown up here, you can say touched his brow if you really want to, but like touched his lips. You can't frown with your mouth. That's not that's not how that works. And then for weird similes and metaphors that don't make sense, uh, I have this one. They were like two trains set on a collision course. Better for all those involved if they did not relish each other's company. At least that way they could avoid colliding at all. So which is it? Are they set on a collision course or are they not? If they're trains literally driving 
towards each other there's no way that they won't collide right like this is this isn't work it's just not working another one i love these resentment swirled through her like a fog tinged in red light what does that mean another one literally a page later too many flashes of movement in all directions too many questions crowding her mind but now that a tense kind of calm had descended m dash an eerie list on a tightrope m dash several details struck Celine as odd what do you mean just randomly throw in the aerialist on a tightrope in the middle of a sentence where it doesn't make freaking sense and to you know top it off that is literally the title of this chapter like the author was so impressed with this really random simile metaphor i don't know which it is that she had to actually title her chapter after it even though it doesn't make any fucking sense and that's pretty much the point where i stopped putting post-it notes whenever that happened because i actually tried to like actively ignore it because it was driving me absolutely up the wall and these are just a few examples of this horrendous writing of things that don't make sense similes that don't work and they just like ruin the entire story because it's impossible to read really another thing i noticed pretty early on which is really odd and like really daring to me is how some of the characters reactions to situations or to each other just don't make sense and i know it's very difficult sometimes to explain when some why something doesn't make sense but you just can't tell that like this is not a normal reaction like a person is laughing at something that isn't funny like by any stretch of the imagination but they're like guff guffawing why is that word that every white author loves to use all the time i don't know like they, when there wasn't any cause at all so celine asks bastion why did the man in the alleyway call you le fantôme do you have a habit of dressing like a ghoul and terrorizing those around you and then he says it's a nickname from childhood do you have a habit of dragging darkness with you wherever you go what says she and then he says celine was a lunar goddess a titan she drove a chariot of white horses across the sky to usher in the night and then she says no i was not named for a goddess celine is a nickname from childhood and then he says i deserve that and starts laughing and i'm like huh <laughs> like i get i get she said the same thing that he did but like huh <laughs> what it's not that witty and that's one of the big problems like they try to make Celine into this really witty character when she really isn't another moment that's again the same situation kind of where Celine and Bastion are talking she says are you not curious about what came first the chicken or the egg and then he says technically he sent her a wicked grin wasn't it the rooster the next instant bright laughter burst from her lips the sound startling those nearby for the second time that evening I mean what how how is that funny how is that at all funny <laughs> these people are so obsessed with each other's wit supposed wit and it's not working that brings us to the main character of celine who is extremely annoying and frustrating to read about she comes to new orleans because as i said of something horrible that she has done and uh, she had to flee basically france and like her leave her past behind then she can't she's very worried that people will find out what she's done because she views herself as so evil because of it and especially throughout the first few chapters it's constantly hinted at at this horrible thing that she has done that has like tainted her forever and that she can't get over she'll even have like these bloody flashbacks to the scene of what happened and it is so persistent and it won't let up and it's extremely annoying i usually don't mind this type of like technique used to like cause tension and excitement in the reader because you want to know what's going on right but the author brings the solution gives the solution to us so quickly that it doesn't really make sense to have concealed it from us in the first place because it's literally like a few chapters in that you find out she killed a man who tried to rape her and now she thinks she's a murderess which i mean it's not good to kill someone but he tried to rape you and uh, it was clearly self-defense so of course you're not evil because of that it doesn't really make sense to me that she would even think that because in other areas she doesn't have very strong like moral beliefs at all she's not really religious she doesn't really care to help people she's more like 
out for her own gain all the time and I don't understand why with that personality she'd be at all conflicted about murdering some murdering killing somebody in self-defense because it just doesn't match up to me. What is equally annoying is her supposed love for danger. This is another thing that just gets crammed down our throats all the time without reprieve and I was so sick and tired of hearing how danger loving she was and again this was just used to make her more interesting to again like put her above other women of her time and I just hate that when authors do that like set a book in a historical time period and then use like feminist or anachronistic character qualities to make the main character seem better than everyone else. Another thing we're constantly reminded of is how beautiful Celine is. Literally every single side character in this book exclusively exists to tell her how beautiful she is, how blessed she was with like assets, you know, like a nice curve, nice breasts and stuff like that, how everything looks stunning on her. It's all she hears all the time and honestly it is fucking annoying. Remember how the like typical YA heroine used to be beautiful but not know it? Well it seems I've turned to a new page where now it is customary for heroines to know that they're beautiful but also despise being beautiful because it gives gets some negative attention. And of course that is like a valid thing to discuss, but Celine actively puts on dresses that are too small for her where her boobs are like almost spilling out of her corset or she'll use her beauty and like appearance to try and manipulate and I was just so confused like which is it are you owning your appearance are you using your body and your beauty to get what you want which is something that I can 100% respect like especially if you live in a time where as a woman you're reduced to your appearance like go and use that to your advantage but then don't turn around and whine about like how horrible it is to be beautiful. Another thing that was really weird to me with Celine is that she keeps saying how much she just wants like unadulterated power. Basically she sees men, she sees men like Bastion especially, who by the way is the head of the Court of Lions basically, who's like her love interest. Uh, she sees men like him and she's like, oh my god, they have so much power, they can do what they want, I want that power. And from the very beginning of the book, she she constantly complains about like not getting to do what she wants all the time and she has to live her life by everybody else's rules. But none of that is actually ever shown in the book. Like, sure, she has to live at the convent and follow the convent's rules, but like honestly, you chose to go there. And if you live in someone's house and under someone's protection, eating their food, you know, you're gonna have to follow their rules. That's unfortunately how life works the 1870s or the 2010s like that's how it works my lady <laughs> this is especially annoying because i totally understand that the narrative was supposed to be like oppressed women in the 1870s wanting to like get to decide the course of their own life right i get that but then you have to have an actually like oppressed and disenfranchised woman as a main character not somebody like celine who just isn't any of those things i would have understood it better if she were at least in a profession or trying to pursue a profession that was barred off from her because of her gender or that you know she couldn't pursue a hobby or something specific that she wanted to do that she would do were she a man or were she to have the power that she craves. But there's actually no specific reasons for her to want this supposed power. For God's sake, she is a dressmaker, which is the epitome of a traditionally female job. Exactly what would you do with this power? You're already pretty powerful in your profession. You're already like a woman of your own right. Like you are a professional woman. You can earn your own money. Why are you, what exactly, where do you want more power? Like that was never actually shown. And so it's just so frustrating. Like if this were a thing that she had mentioned once, I wouldn't have minded as much. But since this is like all that seems to occupy her mind all the time, this like elusive search for power, I just needed to hear at least like one good reason or one good thing that she would actually end up doing with that power. As I said, the plot is pretty bare bones in this book. Basically, we just follow Celine as she somehow gets targeted by this murderer, which doesn't really make sense. And we learn that there's like two bastions, two groups of supernatural beings, the fallen and the brotherhood that live in the city. But this is also really grating to me because none of that is ever actually fully explained. We do occasionally get chapters that are basically from the villain's perspective. They're from they're written in a first person narrative, so we don't know until the end who the villain is. 
this person is basically used or this perspective is basically used as a continuous info dump like that's all it is basically this half of this book is just a villainous monologue explaining why the villain is doing what they're doing not even that is sufficient to really fully picture in your mind like i didn't understand it's not even a full fantasy world you are only drawing upon existing paranormal tropes and creatures and not even those are like specifically explained enough to get make me as a real like understand what they're supposed to be really that's not that hard <laughs> i don't understand how that wasn't a priority in a book that is all about paranormal supernatural things honestly the court of lions which is a random collection of dangerous looking people and that was literally it like i have no idea why any of them mattered at all because none of them played bigger roles and it, they were just there and we didn't know like they constantly kept referring to them as just being magical and like illusionists and the main character when she encountered them would just take this all like without asking any questions she'd just be like oh i guess you can see the future uh huh pretty cool yeah i don't know i'm fine i don't have to ask any further question now that's totally cool that answers everything i wanted to know about that thank you let's talk about the relationship so there's kind of a love triangle between celeste and bastion the leader of the court of lions and then a police detective called michael even though he's supposed to be italian and wouldn't that be michelle but i don't care who is very young and attractive everyone here is young and attractive oh my god but basically apparently bastion and michael used to be best friends as children and now they just hate each other and honestly there's so little to say about this relationship because there is absolutely no foundation for it its development doesn't make any sense it was i think it was supposed to be a hate to love story but why I don't understand like obviously the book is trying to bring this back to this like oh Celine loves danger narrative where she's just drawn to Bastion because he's dangerous but also repulsed by him because he's dangerous because it's like two sides of her warring against each other but like what is with Bastion like why would he at all care about her earlier I gave you these examples from I think it was kind of their first official meeting where they were trying to talk to each other and being like really witty and making each other laugh because they were so funny uh, and that's kind of the only like they haven't really had that many conversations together the, the second or third time they meet they like reveal their deepest secrets to one another and then Celine tells him don't fall in love with me which is such a weird thing to say like basically the first time she meets him she says that to him and I'm like what you are a very narcissistic lady You're, that's mm. That's very presumptuous. <laughs> because the two have so little personality, there's absolutely no chemistry, there's absolutely nothing I was interested in, honestly. Like, no aspect of their relationship was at all interesting to me. Sorry, there's fireworks going on outside. I hope you can't hear them because it's kind of annoying and loud and I don't want to stop to continue this video. But lastly, I want to talk about something that really was one of the biggest things that freaking annoyed me and that were the clumsy and ex extremely ham-fisted discussions that this book tries to have about race and gender equality in 1870s New Orleans. Basically, all of the characters are just plucked out of 2019 and transported back to the 1870s, complete with a 2019 moral compass, beliefs about feminism and female equality and racial equality and all that good stuff. The thing is, it's very easy from a 2019 perspective to write characters that have a 2019 moral compass and beliefs about feminism and gender equality and race, racial equality and sexual equality and all that stuff. It's a lot more difficult and it requires a lot more finesse to write a historical story that actually discusses, like actively acknowledges and discusses in a meaningful, believable, realistic way problematic beliefs held by society at the time. I just think it's kind of almost disrespectful of people that actually were minorities at the time and had to like live through a lot of discrimination or even persecution at the time in history and basically just eradicate that 
by writing main characters that are all conveniently progressive and not actually discuss these issues in any meaningful way. In a lot of ways, I honestly can't help but compare this book to The Diviners, who is set in 1920s New York and deals very tactfully and respectfully and very knowledgeably with the issues of minorities and immigrants in New York at the time. Libba Bray's characters are also kind of progressive in that they're not homophobic, they're not racist, they're not sexist in their actions, but they also feel much more like real people that could have lived at the time discussing these issues within the confines of their time and not cardboard cut out 2019 liberals that are basically just copy pasted into a story set in the 1870s. Honestly, if you want to refuse to adapt your characters to the setting that you have chosen, then please choose a different setting because it's not working. At the end of the day, the only thing I almost kind of liked about this book was the character of Odette because I thought she was the most interesting person of all people. She's a member of the Court of Lions and uh, she basically like dress, sometimes dresses as a man, dresses as a woman, it kind of defies society in that way, but she doesn't feel the need to constantly jam it down your throat which I appreciate and she just seemed like in general the most interesting person there and I wish the book had been about her to be honest. Anyway, that's where I'm gonna end today's video. I hope you enjoyed it. Please don't read The Beautiful, you won't regret it because it's a hot flaming pile of garbage <laughs> and it's not enjoyable in any way shape or form. There's like no suspense, I don't care about anything that happens and the reveal is the most like lackluster boring thing that you've ever read and I promise you you're not missing anything it's not the comeback of vampires that I had hoped for, at least I hope so, because uh, I just need something better than this to make, to be that comeback, right? It, it can't be this book, it just can't be. Anyway, please leave a comment down below, let me know what you think of this video and the book if you've read it yourself, and thumbs up this video and subscribe for more videos very soon, and until then, have a lovely week. Bye!